Megan, we're so excited to have you. Hi, excited to be here. I don't think you need much by way of introduction, but I will give just a couple points. Uh, you had a, you got into journalism at 32, had been a lawyer in a previous life, yep. 12 years at Fox. You now have two shows over at NBC, one in the morning on the Today Show Hour at 9 a.m. Quite a morning for you, I assume. Yeah. <laughs> and then you know, you've done a lot to shine a light on sexual harassment over the years and on your show, and you're not afraid to reinvent yourself. So a lot to dive in, but we got to address the elephant in the room first. Matt Lauer, holy cow. Um, when you woke up this morning, did you know that this was brewing? What were your thoughts? No, I didn't. You know, I, because not at of- all? Not like Variety and New York Times have been working on stories, you don't hear about these things? So I didn't have any official knowledge, but because of the work I do and the stories I cover and the connections I have in the industry, I have a general feel for, I mean, I, I knew the Charlie Rose thing was coming. And I had heard rumors about Matt, but that's all they were. And my feeling on it was a rumor is not the same as reportable fact. And it was also that I hear a lot of rumors about myself too that are completely untrue. And when you're a public figure, people do make up things about you and put them in print. Uh, so I had no inside knowledge at all, but I knew people were sniffing around the issue and you know, hoped it wasn't true. And wouldn't have been surprised if none of that had materialized and he had a long you know, and enjoyable last whatever, however many years he wanted to be at the Today Show. And so you said on your show this morning, it did hit close to home. You know, this is now a colleague of yours, and this is now the second colleague of yours, at least, who has had something like this happen. A third, uh, really. I mean, well, fourth. I don't. Yeah, Bill O'Reilly. Just looking back at Fox, you know, it's like O'Reilly was a colleague, Roger Ailes was my boss, mm -hmm. Eric Bowling was a friend. Right. Um, I don't know. I'm losing track of all, but yeah, a lot. So sad. Um, so you've got quite enough experience with this, unfortunately, and as someone also who's had it happen to them. So um, one thing that happened to you is Roger Ailes had been your boss and your mentor. I believe he sounded really supportive of you at the time. He promoted you twice, I think, on when you were on maternity leave. At least. Yeah, um, and just saw you as a star and helped you rise through Fox. But then you have this great mentor who, in your first year or two at Fox, uh, you say he sexually harassed you. How did you cope with that? Um, as a woman who had this happen to her? Well, I mean, he harassed me early on in my tenure at Fox, and we got past it. And so those promotions and all that happened after we got past it. But I was scared when it happened to me. I was a second year reporter at Fox. I wasn't the me that I am now. I had no power in the industry at all, and no power at Fox News. I was working in the DC Bureau, and I was, I was doing it. I was doing well, I was, I was making my bones. I was reporting on big cases at the Supreme Court using my legal background, breaking news. The Duke alleged rape case was a big case for me and, and I got that one right and most reporters didn't. It was good for me, you know, my, my career was going well. And so when he started, it wasn't clear. Like, he was always bawdy and had an inappropriate sense of humor. But I've never been, some people feel differently, but I've never been somebody who really takes offense at that. Um, and so I was, was quick to write off the comments like, oh, that's just him. So the harassment that I went through wasn't obviously harassment in the beginning, and then it graduated. You know, it was, it just got worse and worse and worse to the point where you couldn't deny it. And he was, it was explicit quid pro quo sexual harassment, which was, you know, basically you sleep with me and I'll give you a promotion. And even in those moments, I tried to laugh it off and pretend I wasn't hearing what I was hearing, or try to pretend that I had misunderstood, because I didn't want a direct confrontation with him. You know, I, I, I didn't want to have to reject him explicitly, and I think this is telling, because a lot of women to whom this happens in the workplace have this calculation where you're thinking, holy, you know what? My whole job is on the line right now. The last thing I want to do is upset and reject my boss. You know, we generally want to charm our bosses and have them feel good about us. Um, and truly, it, it, the culmination of it was in his office when, because you'd go in there and he'd shut the door and he'd lock the door. It's terrifying. And you would, you, would, you would sort of shrug it off because he was known to be very paranoid about security. Um, but that feeling I'll never forget of like going in there and having him lock that door. Um, and then, so it culminated in him trying to be with me physically. And it was only at that point where was, you couldn't pretend it wasn't happening anymore. Um, that I really had to come to terms with it, and I, I ran out of the guy's office. I mean, he tried to grab me three times, 
make out with me, which he didn't. Um, but I had to shove him off of me, and he came back, and I shoved him again, and he came back a third time. And then when I shoved him off the third time, he asked me when my contract was up. Oh, my God. Um, wow. So how do you, you clearly went on from that, um, and I think in your book you talk about you distanced yourself as much as you could from him after these things. Well, I reported it to a supervisor who told me just to steer clear of him. Wow. Which really, I mean, at the time seemed like good advice because it was a good way to navigate forward, but in retrospect was terrible, terrible advice. So you were in a powerless position at the time. When you finally did speak out about it, um, after other colleagues started talking about it, you were in a powerful position. Um, a lot of women that are having to come forward now are not powerful. And as you talked about on your show this morning, you don't see the pain that they're going through um, as something like Matt Lauer has addressed. So what advice do you have for them if they're scared to come forward, if they're maybe not in a powerful position? Well, I understand that because I feel like it's all well and good for me to sit here now in the position I, I now I'm in and say, Report it, you know, go to human resources. Human resources was not an option for me at all at Fox News. It was, it was an entity completely controlled by the CEO, Ailes, who was my harasser. Um, it would have been totally pointless. And I did report it to a supervisor, for that matter, who did nothing about it, predictably. Um, so I want to say to those women, I understand it's not that I am oblivious of how hard it is to go report. But I also want to say, find a way, because the culture I don't want to say has changed, but it is changing meaningfully by the moment, thanks to the women who are finding the courage, somehow who are finding the courage. Let me tell you, when it, this happens to you by somebody who's not that much above you, it's not as scary to report it. The, the women who don't tend to report are the ones who are very low on the totem pole, who are having it happen to them by somebody who's in a lot of power, who they know, because they're not idiots, the company is likely to protect you know, they have an invested interest, a vested interest in this man. And I think to those women, they need to see, take a look at the broader culture right now and see how companies are being forced to respond. And men who have been doing this now have real skin in the game. You know, look at the number of men who have been fired, powerful men who are considered indispensable. We never would have thought Roger Ailes would have been fired by Fox News, ever. Uh, Bill O'Reilly, he was considered indispensable, wrong. Uh, Charlie Rose, on, it, on and on it goes. So I think they, they have to find the courage to, to, to seek somebody out. And if they can't make it be someone in power, someone with real responsibility at the company, go to someone like me, you know, someone who maybe doesn't have a mandatory reporting obligation within the company, but who would be there to advise you. And let me tell you, if a woman came to me at NBC News and said, this has happened to me by somebody, A, I would advise her on what to do, and B, I would work it behind the scenes. To, I, even if I had to go into the boss's office and say, here's a name, go investigate, you have to do some sort of looking, I'm not gonna tell you who reported. I don't have to. Uh, but I think powerful women need to be there for less powerful women so that they can grow into powerful women, so that they're not scared out of the workforce or effectively shoved out, because so often what we see is a woman gets moved. Suddenly her work product isn't as good, right? She chooses to leave because she doesn't wanna live like that. So these companies are bleeding awesome female talent because women don't want to deal with this nonsense. So if it gets to the point where they just can't take it anymore and they don't feel like there's any meaningful avenue, they'll leave. So I could talk to you about this the entire time, but there's so much other ground to cover. So I want to transition a little bit. Um, still a little bit on the harassment line, so you were you know, a subject of this. But the last two years for you, I want to go back to the August 2015 debate, the first presidential debate when you asked this question that rocked the world and sent ripple effects. Uh, and I want to set the scene for it a little bit, too. You and Trump had had some interactions the week prior. He seemed nervous about you. He had actually hung up the phone on you that week. He'd been calling your bosses, being like, what's Megan going to do in the debate? Um, were you worried about that night, knowing what you were going to be asking him about women? I mean, I could. I could feel a storm coming. That's how it felt. He was angry with me, and he, hung, he yelled at me and hung up on me the Monday before that Thursday debate because of a segment I had done on The Kelly File about his alleged rape of Ivana Trump, a story that had been reported in the news. It was based on her sworn deposition testimony saying he had raped her. And then she later recanted. Anyway, this was made an issue in the press in the course of his presidential run, and we covered it on The Kelly File, which he was not happy about. So he called me up and yelled at me and screamed at me and blah, blah, blah. So going, my question that I asked that night about women had long been in the bank. You know, it wasn't like I wrote that after, our, after he yelled at me, but it certainly did 
make me realize, or he's already angry and he's not going to like this question. But what can you do? You're, you're a journalist. Sometimes you make people angry. So it's you, you ask a it, job. and it has, you know, Trump's clearly not happy. Uh, he goes and talks about you bleeding out of wherever. Uh, his lawyer tweets about you being gutted or gutting her. We can gut her. Uh, yeah. Well, so tell me about what the weeks and months were like being, as Maureen Dowd put it, Trump's chew toy. I know you're laughing, but I really don't like that. I didn't like that at all. And objected. I didn't like the way she phrased it. It was bullshit. Can you swear here? Um, I wasn't. I never backed down from him. I never stopped covering him fairly, the controversies he generated. I never was cowed out of fear, even though the security threats in my life went like this, in my children's lives, like this. And it was hard to go out there night after night and do that and find the courage to cover him fairly, but not overcorrect to the point where you bashed him because he was coming after you and causing this issue in your life. And I was not his chew toy. He continued to try to bully me, and I call it an attempted bullying, because an effective bullying causes change in the other person's behavior. He didn't. Um, and at the end of nine months of relentless, relentless attacks, over 100 tweets, um, you know, that the guy, his Dan Scavino, who's now the White House Director of Social Media, who was relentless too, and orchestrated a campaign against me online, uh, Michael Cohen, who is the one who's Trump's lawyer, he's now working for the president, who said, we can gut her. I mean, to tens of thousands of people he's tweeting out, we can gut her, when the, there's a fever pitch already uh, against me. It wouldn't stop. Nothing would stop the behavior. He never could get past it. Um, and finally, I decided to take the situation in hand and go right to Trump Tower and stand him down, which is what I did. Right, but that's after your daughter, I think well, your daughter came to you and said, mom, what's a bimbo? And asked you, does Donald Trump want to hurt you? And you had people showing up at your door, at your home, your family security is at stake. That must have been awful. The Yardley moment was maybe the lowest moment of all. It was one of the lowest moments. And Yardley my, is your daughter. She's my daughter, she's six now. Um, we didn't share with our kids at all any of his nonsense because they have enough to worry about and need to worry about presidential politics and certainly not anything involving me and the possible president. Um, but they heard things, you know, they live in this world. So Yardley came home one day and, and asked me, what's a bimbo? And because he had tweeted that out about me. And the thing about it that was so devastating is a year earlier, not, not a year, not long earlier, I can't remember exactly the timing, but I had taken her with me to the Fortune Most Powerful Women's Conference. And she, she said to me on the train ride down there, what, what is this thing we're going to? And I said, well, this is a conference that talks about really powerful women who've done great things and celebrates them. And she looked at me and said, are we two of them? And, you know, just I thought about the loss that my child had suffered without even knowing it, of thinking, you know, going from thinking she was, she was at five or four at the time, a, a fortune most powerful woman, to asking me what a bimbo is. It, to this moment, it's painful. It's, it's not, listen, I, I can take, listen, a lot of people call me names, I can, I can take it. But there was a loss in that moment. She lost something. And, and every time a, a, a man, whether it is our president or a news anchor, demeans or diminishes a woman by grabbing her ass or talking about her body or coming on to her instead of asking for her ideas and treating her like a professional in the workplace setting, they lose something too. It's not, it, it's not a small matter, it's a huge deal. And it's been happening systemically for far too long. I feel like this is the first moment we're starting to think, maybe it doesn't have to keep happening. Maybe we won't be the nice women and girls we've been raised to be. That is what is prized among women and young girls. Niceness. Go along to get along. Don't cause waves. Enough of that.
enough of that. And so you're talking about a lot, that a lot on your show and using that as a, to power the empowerment revolution, as I think you like to say. But I want to talk about how you came to NBC. You've come off this very tough year um, being a, the subject of 100 Trump tweets. Um, and you realize, what? What was it that, about Fox that made you be like, I need something else, I want something new? NBC is a big change. It was a combination of a lot of things. First and foremost, I was not seeing my children grow up. You know, I would leave for work at 3, 3.30, which is exactly when your kids get home from school. You know, they, they had aged into that school schedule. When I started the Kelly File, they were all, they were four, three, and newborn. By the time I left, they were, two out of three were in school till three. So I wasn't seeing them. I wasn't seeing two out of my three children Monday through Friday, except for that 45 minutes in the morning where you're just yelling at them to get their backpack and their sneakers and get out, you know? <laughs> which is not meaningful. So I wasn't happy. It wasn't good enough. You know, I'm fine being a working parent. I need to be a working parent. I love my work. That wasn't good enough. The balance had tipped too far. Um, professionally, I really felt like there was no more growth for me at Fox News, that I had done all the things I wanted to do there. But I would press you on, I think a lot of people would say that right now is the most important time in the history of American politics. And you were seen as a leader. You have this great following on Fox. Um, you have the base's ear watching your show. Why take yourself out of politics right now? Don't you think the world needs more of that hard-hitting journalism? I'm all for hard-hitting journalism. However, I do feel that in the era of Trump, you might as well go stand on the edge of the Pacific and scream at the top of your lungs all day, every day. Um, OK. So I mean, I can tell you, truly, I, I anchored on the Fox News Channel at 9 p.m., one of, if not the most powerful time slot there, uh, for a full year. And I covered every controversy of his earnestly and tough, in a tough manner. Um, from you know, the Gold Star family, uh, Judge Curiel, women, you name it, right? I, I was the first to call out his misogyny publicly. Um, did it do any good? Were hearts and minds changed? Was there an available audience to me at the Fox News Channel of Republicans and independents and Democrats who are open-minded who were there for persuading? You tell me. I, it's not to say that there's no value in political journalism. I do believe that journalists are the first draft historians, and that's, there's value in that. But if you, if you are covering politics to try to persuade people, which is what I think people wanted me to do, you're wasting your time. The Trump voters are dug in on Trump. The Trump haters are dug in on Trump. There's so much that goes into their very strong views on him. And frankly, I thought to myself, I could also get into a bath every morning of carcinogens and just roll around in it all day. But that's not good for me either. I really, I, my whole feeling, it's not just Trump, my feeling on the beltway, on on political news is the, the folks inside the Beltway are dead to us. We have to forge on without them. The, the, the leaders to me, nine times out of 10, are feckless and spineless and often controlled by big money interests and don't seem to have any real appetite anymore for getting things done or reaching across the aisle or reaching compromises that work for the American people. We have to do an end around. And I would love to be part of raising powerful boys and girls, sending messages out into the world and our country that are more positive and inspirational and aspirational, and celebrating people who have had challenges in their own lives and showing people a way to deal with them. That, I think, has value. That is not screaming into the Pacific. Um, so I admire those who do it. Don't get me wrong. It's hard. It's harder than it's ever been to be in political journalism. I tip my hat to my colleagues who do it, and I know them all. Uh, but I can see on most of them the, the wear and tear, how hard it is, and how not rewarding right now. So it sounds like you know, screaming to the Pacific, the Pacific, it almost felt like a helpless situation no matter what you said. Oh, I would never use that word about <laughs> me or my life. Right. Well. Fair. Um, but at NBC, you're trying, it sounds like you're, you're hoping to reach the core of America and influence their values and, and do that with your show. Has it been, um, look, you've interviewed Trump, Putin, dealt with all sorts of things. Has it Big been, Bird. 
Big Bird, of course. Been has, the full <laughs> range. Has it been hard, harder than you thought to do a morning show where things are like happy and cheery and lighter? No, it hasn't been hard. And I, I don't really think about challenges in my life as hard. I, I don't think that's helpful thinking. Um, I like challenges. You know, I said to my husband when I was thinking about leaving Fox that we were actually in Lake Placid and we were hiking up this mountain. It was a small mountain. I'm not an exerciser. Uh, but we got to the top and I said, I was thinking about, you know, do I leave, do I stay? And I said, you know, sometimes, sometimes the ascent is more enjoyable than being at the summit. Building something, creating something, building new muscles, you know, growing. And that, that's what I'm doing. You know, I, m my friends who know me, they, they, see, they see the me they know on the Today Show. Um, people who only knew me from snippets of Fox News think I, I'm all sharp elbows. And I have them, and I can use them, and I still will. Um, but that's not all of me. And I actually think it's been a very sexist meme for people to suggest that because you can throw a sharp elbow when necessary, that you have no softness to you. I would submit that is not true of me, nor any woman I know, nor any man for that matter. Um, so. For me, it's been a delight because I have this platform where I can tap into the other pieces of me. And if you need to be hard hitting in any given interview, and I've already had a couple of those on my show, you can be. But I also have these other venues at NBC that, that will allow me to do political journalism. I'll be on air for NBC on the big political nights um, and on the Sunday show where I did Putin. And you know, all that's still fair game. It's just my focus is on something that I hope is more uplifting than than, than the stoking of outrage you get in political coverage. Um, do you, there's been a lot of, uh, if you were hoping to not be the story anymore, I think that that has not happened. You are constantly okay, let's in see the that news. Point. Yeah, uh, you have a very big fan of Jezebel who writes about you quite often and you invite Bobby him Finger. Oh yes, yes, your favorite. <laughs> um, and he came on your show and you, it was kind of a funny moment. But um, so how do you deal with the criticism and the ratings talk, and is there pressure from NBC to really nail this morning hour? They've been great. NBC has put zero pressure on me. I've only felt supported by them. You know, we're just, we're little babies. We're a little like a little nine-week-old baby on my, on my show, and so we're getting it going, you know? It's like, we're right now, we're starting to find our voice, hit our stride, things are growing, so I feel, I feel good about it, and, and they feel good about it. They've done nothing other than support me. Um, criticism, it's part of the game, you know? I'm not gonna lie, it isn't pleasant. It's not like I'm some, I'm impervious to it, I'm just this, I'm like, I'm fine. I cry, I, you know, hold my husband and say, oh, it's, why does it have to be so hard? Why does it have to be this way? But then I pick myself up, dust myself off, and just do the damn job. I mean, that's what, that's what you have to do. And if you go through it enough times, it does get easier, which is what I wanna tell others. So if, you, if a big crisis hits you in your life, or you find yourself on the receiving end of great criticism, whether it's as public as, as I have or some other um, amount, you should welcome it because it's an opportunity to grow. You know, you will emerge out the other side stronger than when you began, and there's value in that. So you are not someone who's afraid to speak your mind, to do what you believe is right, even if it is unpopular, at times it is, um, and at times you've been proven really right. So I would say one of those moments is Alex Jones got a lot of, um, Flack for interviewing him, and then the interview came out, and people were like, oh, this is actually important journalism. Um, you had a moment on Fox News where you defended women in the workplace to the point where a stranger named Sheryl Sandberg called you up and said, I love you, <laughs> which is amazing. Um, but you've also had moments where, you know, when you're constantly speaking your mind, you're gonna say things that don't always resonate or people don't agree with. Um, I think one notable one is, Santa is white on Fox was a moment. Um, the first week of your show, there were a few statements that rubbed people the wrong way about Jane Fonda and plastic surgery and things like that. Um, upon further reflection, do you regret anything that you've said out there and is Santa still white? I regret a lot of what I've said. I mean, you're gonna be on the air several hours a week, live television, you're gonna say stupid shit. Um, it's, that's just the reality, you know? Um, so yeah, there's a lot I'd like to go back and say differently. Um, all I can tell you is, I think the lens is a truth teller. And people who watch you day after day will see who you are without the caricature of you that's put out there by websites and so on looming over you. Um, you know, I, 
one of my great struggles at Fox was I felt everything I did was viewed through a negative prism by those who didn't like Fox or what it stands for. And I hated that. You know, I think there's a lot of people over there who are good people and solid journalists who I love who struggle with that. Uh, and I'm sure people at other stations have the same thing. You know, people have a worldview about certain journalists or their organizations. And I really hope that in my new position, people will just just see me for who I am and not through that, not through that prism, you know? So far, I feel like it's happening. Um, but I feel like time will tell. You'll, you'll see me and you'll, you'll figure out who I am and then people will accept or not accept based on what they see. And that's all, that's all I can ask of anybody. Yeah. So I want to, I, like I said, I could talk to you for hours, but we don't have that much time. So I just want to wrap it up with your philosophy on life. Uh, you wrote a bestseller called Subtle for More. And it came from when you were a lawyer. You were a high-powered lawyer on track to become a partner um, in your early 30s. And you watched Dr. Phil on Oprah. And he says something that really just resonates. Um, what was that? And then like, how did you put it to action? He said, the only difference between you and someone you envy is you settled for less. And honestly, I resolved in that moment that I would settle for more, that I would change my life. I had been a very unhappy lawyer. I had no life. I was, I was just, I didn't understand. I, I became a lawyer because I really thought that it would help people take me seriously. I thought it was somehow going to legitimize me to have an ESQ after my name. And, and it did to some extent. It did, but at what cost? You know, I wasn't happy. And uh, it wasn't, you know, after 9-11, I was in Chicago for 9-11, practicing law. And I saw all these journalists out there on the street at great risk to themselves reporting the news fairly, professionally, you know, appropriately, hu humanely, you know. Like they didn't lose their humanity in, in doing it, but they also weren't making the story about themselves. And I just thought, wow, I admire them. I admire them. And I'd always thought about broadcast journalism. And I, I was feeling of the reporters a certain kind of envy of like they've, they're doing a public service to me right now as a viewer watching this. So it was after that I heard Dr. Phil, my life was miserable, and I decided to settle for more and, and just try something else. And it worked out. You know, I didn't know anybody in journalism. I didn't have any connections. I didn't come from a family with connections of any kind. Um, but there was a woman named Meredith in my guitar class and it, as it turned out, not long after that, she wasn't there. I found out it was because she worked at WMAQ, the Chicago NBC O&O. And I said, oh my god, you're in news? Can I take you out for a cup of coffee? And she said yes. She helped me make a resume tape, which is what you need to get a, an on-air job as a reporter. And uh, the rest is history. And so you've become extremely successful. Uh, I think you own a green t-shirt I read that says, I want it all. Uh, I would say that you do. Uh, to quote this good friend now of yours, Dr. Phil, he said, successful lawyer, top journalist, wife, mother of three. If that's a bimbo, I hope all of my granddaughters grow up to be bimbos. <laughs> um, so now that you do have it all, are you happy? Um, are you exhausted? Is it possible to become too successful? <laughs> happy and exhausted, yes. I would say I, I'm as happy as an Irish Catholic can be. You know, I don't know. <laughs> There's a lot of guilt. Um, <laughs> I am happy. I am. You know, it's like my happiness doesn't revolve so much around my job, although my job right now is joyful. Um, it revolves around the core people in my life who make me me, who help make me me. And so your job, I think it can, it can drive you to unhappiness. You know, I certainly see that. And it can stir up your happiness. Like it can maybe take it up a notch or two. But I am happy because I have Doug and I have my three children and I, I have my good friends and they, they make me feel connected to other human beings in this world. My children make me feel hopeful. My husband makes me feel connected and supported. Um, I, that's what I need. You know? And to me it's very empowering because I feel like whether it was my job at Fox, my job at NBC, my job as a lawyer, none of that has power over me. I, I don't lie awake at night worrying about that stuff because it, it can come and it can go and I'll be just fine. I am still here and I have my people and I have myself and I, I believe in what I stand for and I know who I am because I've been self-reflective and I've thought about it. I've tried to do better, you know? Um, I think it's too often we give too much power to the things that drive our ego. 
you know? And I think one of the blessings of the launch of my show, which, you know, ha has not been without some bumps in the road, has been the joy I've felt for the past nine weeks, because I think it's a tell that my, my happiness is real. It is connected to the work I'm doing and the people I've surrounded myself with. You know, and there's not some outside ego-driven thing happening of my power or my reach or my whatever. It isn't about the money or the ratings or any of that. It is about the way I feel. In the same way they say you know who your friends are by the way you feel when you're around them, I feel like you know whether you've made the right life choices by the way you feel when you're around those choices. When I am around my NBC family and my show, I feel great. I feel like this, I really do. When I'm around my husband, I feel like this, and it wasn't always thus. I used to be married to somebody else. It didn't work out. Um, it was part of settling for more, and he wound up married to a woman he loves, and they have three children too, so it worked out well for both of us. Uh, but I think it believes with an honest gut check. You have to do it, and so you can lie to as many people as you want about your level of happiness and what works for you, but you must not lie to yourself. All right, well, Megan, thank you so much for the time. It's been fun. My pleasure. Thank you.